I come to the book of John. Let me finish this thing up with the book of John, if you will, please. John chapter 18. Uh, John chapter 18. And we're going to talk about the thing that I, I finished up with, or I didn't finish this morning. Uh, we'll talk about this thing now. 36, 1836. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Father, bless your word. We pray, God, that you might bless these folks that have come out and braved this weather and be with the folks that are at home. And we'd ask, God, that you might bless the mamas especially today. And we sure appreciate them, Lord. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, now I told you this morning they take the word now out or they remove the word not, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my hand. What they do is they, they take the, those words out to mess with that particular verse. Why? That particular verse right there, more than any other verse, shows the Lord's kingdom is going to be a literal, physical, earthly kingdom and it's going to be set up with a military rule at some point. Not now. Not was it now, back then when Jesus was there with Pontius Pilate and with Herod. Pontius Pilate and Herod were trying to protect their kingdom from a coming king. They were trying to hold on to what they have. Now you get the thing going on right now, and it's not going on really in other countries, but it goes on big in the United States, and it's beginning to permeate independent Bible-believing Baptists. And what they're starting to do is get in all this malicious stuff and get all caught up in this governmental stuff and get all caught up in this deal that has to do with maintaining something now, bringing the kingdom now. The old Southern Baptists taught that the kingdom, they didn't believe in a premillennial return of Jesus Christ. They believed in a postmillennial return of Jesus Christ or amillennial that he didn't ever return at all. They believed that, the, that you would do things would get so good that God would just say, man, y'all are doing such a great God job, I'm going to come down there and bless it. That's postmillennial theology. That means God doesn't come until you get it all fixed. Let me just tell you this. Every dispensation ends with us making a mess of everything. Not a single one ends in a great way, including the one where the Lord himself is ruling and reigning on the throne. That ends with the devil coming out and people still following behind him. But let me just give you this word of caution and then we're going to move on. He says, not now. You are not fighting the second advent. You are not fighting the battle of Armageddon. And you are not supposed to be trying to sustain your way of life by overthrowing governments in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can't hide behind the Bible to try to justify your constitutional rights. I don't care if you got constitutional rights. That's your business. I don't care if you got a right to bear arms. I don't care if you got a right to shoot them. But don't try to hide behind this to act like that's what Jesus is telling you to do. He ain't telling you to do that. I'm catching a lot of heat lately and saying, well, how come you're not speaking out from the pulpit about all the foolishness of the government? And I said, have you read your Bible? Do you realize who was in power when they were trying to kill Jesus? Do you realize who was in power when they were trying to kill Peter? Do you realize who was in power when they tried? I said it was Rome. And Jesus never said, I'm here to overthrow him. He said, not now. So Pete, you know what he does? He grabs his sword and instead of using it for self-protection against robbers and things like that, he's coming against the authorities. The Lord wouldn't have said nothing to him if he whacked the robber. The sword was for personal protection. But it wasn't to go start a militia or start a military movement. So what happens there is, is he pulls out his sword and misuses it. The Lord said, Peter, what are you doing? Don't you understand this thing is global? This thing is worldwide? This thing is not just Jacksonville, Duval County, the United States of America. It's worldwide. That stuff that, that many people are using nowadays, you got a military for that stuff. And thank God you do. It's being downsized and downplayed now to the point where it eventually will probably cease to exist. But that has nothing to do with you as a Christian. Your Christianity is not based upon whether you do or don't get protection or whether you do or don't have rights. If that's what your Christianity is, ladies and gentlemen, you ain't got no Christianity. That may not be good English, but it makes sense. Christianity works in a jail cell, it works in Nigeria, it works in Africa, it works in China, it works in Japan, it works everywhere in the world, including the United States. It doesn't base anything at all on whether you've got a cotton-picking constitution or not. That stuff makes me so mad that people are so worried about using the Bible to give the constitution authority. Well, I don't go by a constitution. I go by a Bible. I don't use the pulpit to defend the constitution. 
That has to do with this people, the people, the people, the people, the people. That's just as wicked as Joel Osteen's Be a Better You. And I realize what I'm saying, and I realize who I'm saying it to, and I can tell by the looks of some of your faces, you're getting mad about it. Well, good. About time I made some of you a little bit upset. You're too focused on that stuff because of your own comforts. And that passage right there that we went over this morning, he said, it's good for me, I've been afflicted by who? People. People, that's the context of the passage. At the end of the thing, he says, it's good you brought the wrong people in my life to affect me the way you did to teach me some things I wouldn't have learned any other way. God put that stuff in there, and listen, if the Apostle Paul had never gotten put in jail, the Philippian jailer would have been up the creek without a paddle. God knew exactly what he was doing. Paul, you better get your hands off of me, man. Who should know who I am? I'm telling you what, I'll call down fire from heaven. The Lord says, good night, Paul. I want you in jail. You say, why? Because I was there. What happened to the greatest preacher born of a woman? Jail. Head cut off. Paul, jail. Head cut off. Jesus, jail. Crucified. Peter, if it's true, we know he murdered, but very likely crucified upside down. John, boiled in oil, cast out to the Isle of Patmos, comes back in, the Lord gives him grace to let him finish writing the book of Revelation, lets him see stuff, and then he goes on. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, don't get caught up. His kingdom is not now. We're not bringing in the kingdom. You need to get that out of your mind. We are premillennial, pre-tribulation. That means we get out, go up, then he brings it in when we come with him. But you don't get it all fixed and all straightened out by getting the right people in office, whoever in the cat hair that'd be. If I get all caught up in elections and get all that, listen, I just get stirred up about the Lord bringing the king and we ain't got nothing else to worry about. I'm looking for a king. I'm not looking for another president. I hope this, I hope this is the last one. Or let me go. Y'all can have all of them you want. Have ten more. I don't care. I'm just ready to go. I want to see a king. I was talking to other, one of our other deacons, Brother Brad. He said, Preacher, when is the rapture? I said, I don't know, man. But I wish it was now. He said, me too. Amen. I can't figure it out. If I could figure it out, if the Lord would give it to me, I promise you, I'd make a fool of myself. I'd tell everybody. It's happening on, you know, uh, June the 29th, 19, or 2014. We're out of here. <laughs> you know, but I couldn't tell you when it's going to happen. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But let me just warn you, be very careful about that. Now look, if you will, please, in verse number 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou king then? Jesus answered, thou, art, thou sayest that I am king. To this end was I born, and for this cause I came to the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Uh-oh. My sheep know my voice and hear me. If you're of the truth. Let's look at this real quick. John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. Verse number 31. Is that already Tyndall 6? All right. John chapter 8, verse number 31. And uh, let's see. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now I'm going to show you in just a minute who that truth is. Look at verse 46. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. You ever had that happen to you? You tell somebody the truth and they don't believe you? You deal with a Campbellite the other day, a Church of Christ individual, and, well, I just believe baptism's a part of salvation. I said, okay, well, here's what the Bible says. Well, I know, but Acts 2.38, I, I know what Acts 2.38 says, but here's what the Bible says. Yeah, but I know, but I just believe this. I tell you the truth, and guess what? Paul says, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Because it flies in the face of what you want to believe instead of what it says? Well, I don't like it. Yeah, but it'll help you. The truth will make you free. Verse number 47, if you will, please, same passage. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. That's a pretty, pretty rough statement. God said, the reason you can't hear me is you're not of me. Well, if you're not of him, then you know who you're of? Look in verse 44, it'll tell you. God says you're either of God or you're of the devil. Isn't that something? There's no in-between. You're not of yourself. You either belong to God or you belong to the devil. Uh, one thing that you better check up and make sure of is if you can't hear him talking, verse, uh, John chapter 7, then you better make sure you're his. Amen. And if you are his and you know that you're his, then you get the carnality out of the way and get the pride out of your way and it'll unstop your ears. Amen. 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 That pride gets in the way. 
Now you measure, tell the measure of a man by what he loves and what he hates and how well he takes a rebuke. Those three things will define any person. What does he love? What does he hate? And can he take a rebuke? When I say take a rebuke, can you take being corrected when you've already made up your mind that I just believe what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to do and I just think, and then the next thing you know, you start invoking God. Well, I just believe it's what God wants me to do. What if the Bible says it ain't? What if the Holy Spirit says it ain't? Are you even open to that? What if it affects your finances? Just saying. John chapter 7, look if you will please, verse number 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh the, uh, his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Now let's talk about this thing about truth for a second. Look in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. I promise you, and I'm not just saying this, I promise you I won't be long. I would appreciate very much your prayers. I appreciate the privilege of going and, and having the opportunity to go and minister to some preachers and some other people and things like that. Uh, but, but for me, I, I always take my red shoes with me, not to wear up here, but when I get back to the motel, I click them all the time and say, there's no place like home, there's no place like home, and I want to come home. But I appreciate the privilege of going, and, and, and uh, I covet your prayers, and I mean that. Uh, I told Brother Sam, he went with me on a trip recently, and I said, I feel like I'm going in, into, a, into a war zone. He said, you seem like you get kind of sifted up or serious. I said, yeah, I feel like I'm going into a war zone. And it won't let up until I get ready to start heading back home. And uh, that's how I feel when I, when I leave. Uh, don't, I don't like leaving. I don't like leaving my wife behind. She doesn't get to go with me everywhere. I don't like leaving my church behind. I don't like leaving my dog behind, for that matter. I'm scared to death here lately. My dog's going to die while I'm gone, and then she's going to have to put up with that. I guess I'm going to have to call one of you guys over there to dig a hole for me because I'm going to have him buried at the house. But you can't just throw him in the koi pond or something, you know. That'll be a sad day when that happens. I had that dog 14 years now. Ugh. <laughs> you see, what is his, his name is Zeke Peacock. <laughs> he's part of the family. <laughs> he's getting where he can't get up and down the stairs sometimes, so he stands there and kind of looks at you like that. And Drina said, give me a ride. Give me a ride. I said, what do you say, boy? He said, give me a ride, please. So I pick him up like that, and he looks at me, you know, and he lays his head right here, and I'll take him up there, and I'll put him down, you know. <laughs> And then you're supposed to treat him because you gave him a ride like he did you the favor. So where's my treat, man, you know? Uh, it's bad, boy. It's going to be bad. I love him, boy. He's been a good one. He's an old stray dog. Found him out running the street. Yeah. A woman that came to our church drove UPS trucks. Kept seeing him out there. Afraid he's going to get run over. He's out there all shaggy, mangy. He's about that big around when we got him. Literally, you turn him sideways, you thought he was a cardboard cutout. <laughs> and covered up with fleas, man, and eat up, man, I mean, I mean, Thank you, Lord. and scared of everybody Amen. and thought everybody was going to hurt him. You put him around a kid, he'd bite them kids. I'd go to pet him in, he'd show his teeth. He wasn't big as a minute, he'd big, fit in the palm of my hand. And my wife said, well, I like him. Can we just keep him for a little while? And I said, well, you know, we keep him for a while. He had a sister, too. And so we add those dogs, and then I put them in the kennel, and they yelp and holler all night long and whine and moan. And then the dog starts pooping out pacifiers and crayons and all kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm thinking, something's wrong with this dog. <laughs> and so we took him to an old friend of ours, an old vet on the other side of the, uh, of the uh, thing there in, in, in Riverside. We've been seeing for years. An old doctor there ran over his daughter when he was, she was young. Didn't mean to. Just a real fine old guy. And uh, took him in there and he said, wow, this dog's been starving to death. He just eats whatever he can find. And the reason he's afraid of kids is, he said, kids have been abusing him, so he's scared he thinks kids are his enemies. Well, of course, you know what the story is. Over a period of time, she loves him and cares for him and, you know, intercedes for him, I guess you might say. And it wasn't long before I saw how much she loved that dog, and I fell in love with that dog. So when I see that dog, it reminds me. So what does he do? Not much. He can't hear nothing now. He can't even, he can't even hear his master's voice anymore. 
You can still see good though. If he sees a shadow cross in front of the door, he'll start barking, get that tail up in the air and he'll start barking and all that. And then after he barks a while, he turns around and looks to see. <laughs> I got it, Dad, you know. If you came to the door, he'd lick you to death. He wouldn't do nothing to you, but he's letting you know I'm ferocious, you know, I'm protecting everything. She's got a bunch of ducks out in the backyard coming now. She's feeding the whole neighborhood full of ducks, 20 or 25 of them things. Some of them ain't big as a flea. They come in there, she's got this dish out there. They all jump in the dish, you know, and <laughs> like that and that stuff. Open the door, and Zeke looks over there at him like, whatever. And he, just, he walks around them. He don't even mess with them. He used to, he'd chase them. Now he just looks at them like, yeah, pretty good eating around here, isn't it? She's a good woman, isn't she? Hang around here, they'll take care of you. <laughs> I know I'm a wimp, man, but that dog's always glad to see me. Now, he loves her. It's pitiful. She'll run up the stairs, his hips are bad. If she's gone more than a minute, he's up off the floor and he's starting to climb up the stairs. And she'll come out and say, no, 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 don't, don't, come, don't come up here. Don't, I'm coming back down. I'm coming back down. And then vice versa. If she goes down, if, he, if she doesn't come back in a minute, he's coming down one step at a time. He doesn't bound up the stairs anymore. He takes a step, and then he brings his back legs up, and he takes a step. And I let him do it. It's good exercise for him, but it hurts him. It bothers him, but he wants to be close to the one he loves. You say, what do you see in that? <laughs> Conviction. Amen. I'm thinking, man, how come I can't pursue the Lord that way? Even if it hurts me. Amen. That thing this morning, I remember uh, uh, an illustration my daddy used to use a long time ago. I'll get this in just a second here. My illustration my dad used to, there was a, a fellow, the kid was born years ago. It's a true story. And the, the kid's legs were all twisted up. And back in those days, they didn't have ways to fix them. He didn't have the money to have it fixed. So he went to the library, and he read every book he could read on all these things about this particular bone disease that the kid had and all that stuff. And he went into a carpenter shop, and he started making little boxes for these legs. He made all these little boxes. And then gradually, what he would do is, is every, every night, that kid would come in. He'd put that kid's legs in the box, and he would tighten them down. And the little kid would just scream and yell and scream and holler and go to sleep with tears dried on his cheek and that kind of a thing. At 15 years of age, that boy was in a, a race, a foot race, and he won the race. And when they gave him his little blue ribbon, his the trophy medal of the tag thing that he won there, he said, I would just like to say this, Daddy, thank you for hurting me. So if Daddy had never hurt him, he'd have never run, see? Man, God knows what he's doing when he hurts us. Wish I could get you to understand that, folks. God's not doing it because he hates you. He hears you holler. He hears you crying. He knows it hurts. But he's looking down yonder and he's saying, Man, why do you get up here and run these streets of gold? You're going to come by my house one day and say, Daddy, I sure appreciate you hurting me. Thank you. Sure appreciate it, Daddy. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You're a good father. I'm glad you didn't quit when I was screaming. Amen. Boy, if you could get that. You could get that. You get a different view of the point of God. Amen. Instead of this, God's just ready to knock the tar out of you because you mess up. Okay, we all mess up. You didn't realize that by now? Can't we get that holy sort of a self-righteous veneer off of us? Amen. That thing stinks like a Amen. inside of a dead man. It just, it just has an air about it, like, you know, oh, well, we, we would never do that. No, you'd do a whole lot worse than that. Right, amen. Instead of that, just saying, well, God's just good to me in spite of me. Amen. You get right there. You get to just loving God and appreciating God and enjoying being around God. And you just sort of, you know, somebody comes up and says, man, you did a real good job. You seem to be a good person. You say, yeah, well, thank you, but by the grace of God, there's no telling what I'd be. Instead of that hierarchy kind of an attitude, like, oh, I would never do that. 
I look at some of these kids, man, I think to myself, they never even had a chance. Some of these kids, they wind up in jail. And they're bad and they deserve to be there. And I put plenty of them there. But I'm thinking, man, what if they'd have had a mom and daddy like I had? Amen. Or grandparents like some of you had or somebody that cared about them. You think they'd be there? I mean, you know, well, you know, they should have known better. Yeah, but, but would you have known better if somebody hadn't have taken a shine to you? I mean, really, sometimes we just, we just look at them like, oh, I'll never be there. Let's go help them out. Like you're, that's patronizing them. That, that makes my skin crawl. Right, amen. You help them out, not because you think you're better than them. You're sitting there thinking, man, you got called and I did and I got breaks and you didn't get it. If I had what you got, I'd have been worse than you are. Yeah. I believe that. Amen. I've told you time and time and time again, I believe God allowed me to be a policeman to keep me out of trouble. I don't know, man. I might have been the one chasing the dragon. I'd probably been dead by now. I'd have probably had so much powder up my nose and stuff in my arm. I wouldn't have done anything halfway, man. I'm telling you, I probably would have been. I'd have never met her. I can't imagine that. My wildest dreams, I can't imagine having somebody that's in the ministry and not supporting me and not helping me and not being doing without, not being left out, not being ignored. I can't imagine what that would have been like. The Lord goes all the way back there 34, 35 years now and says, she'll fit for you right there. How about taking that one right there? She'll put up with you when I got something to do later on. My goodness, man. And then I see some people, they grow up, man, they got a wife, man. Jezebel ain't got nothing on her. And the Lord says, well, suppose I gave you one like that. How would you be? I don't know about you. I'll just be honest with you. I don't even know if I'd be in church. If I had to deal with that every day at home, you've got to be kidding me, man. I ain't that tough. I'll be done slap somebody. I'll be sitting in jail or something. <laughs> really. I'm, I'm just telling you. I don't want you to get this idea of, oh, no, everything's fine. No, I got the brakes. God's been merciful to me. He gave me a bunch of brakes. You hear me? Not just not making me pay for the, some of the idiotic, stupid things I did. Amen. I ain't going to talk to him about that poll, though. But at any rate, not just that, but not even letting those things transpire. Let me give you this thing on truth. We'll go ahead and stop for tonight. Oh, I'm getting so upset, but I, I'm just, it's just overwhelming, man. Look at that old dog, man, and I think to myself, that dog would be dead right now after he'd spent a life of being kicked around and mistreated and happened to run into somebody happenstance. I ain't no Calvinist. I'm just trying to make an illustration and bring him into home and have him taken care of and watched over like he's, in a, like he's a human being. And I promise you with all my heart, sometimes I look at that dog and I think that dog looks and says, well, thank you. I sure appreciate you taking care of me. Sure beats the fire out of where I was at. And then I think to myself, the last time you just said thank you to the Lord like that. It seemed the living condition I'd have been in if it hadn't been for you. He's just been merciful to me. Let's look at this thing called truth right here real quick. Verse 20, 1 John 5, 20. We know the Son of God has come. And hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. So truth is him. Watch it. And we are in him that is true. Even in his son Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. So you know what he's saying to uh, Pilate there when he's standing in front of him? He's saying, what is truth? And he's going. I got your answers, Pilate. You got an opportunity to do right, and if you do right, I'll get it done by some other means. But you don't have to become a tool of the devil right now. 
I don't know what situation you're in, ladies and gentlemen. I can't tell you. But I'd like for you to go away from here thinking this. God's got the whole thing in control, and even if it's hurting real bad right now, and even if you're having a lot of pain physically, emotionally, <clears throat> or otherwise, God's doing it for your good because he's got eternity in mind for you. And that's the truth. And that's not something you can fix. But that's something if you'll let him, he can make it come out the right way.